time for a question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Royal Opposition. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Uh, before I begin, uh, Speaker, I want to uh, say on behalf of the Ontario PC Caucus, we want to give our thanks to the RCMP, Toronto Police, York, Peel, the OPP, uh, CSIS, and leaders in Toronto's Islamic community for thwarting the terrorist plot and to keep on terrorists. Thank you. Speaker, I have a, a question for the, um, the Minister of uh, Finance uh, based on his remarks um, yesterday to the um, Economic Club. Uh, just a um, a quick direct question, Minister of Finance. Minister, in your speech, you said you're going to hold the line on taxes, and then you talked about increasing new revenue tools. Can you please distinguish for question. us the difference between a revenue tool and a tax? Thank you. <laughs> well, Mr. Speaker, what I said yesterday was the following. We've been able to beat our targets by $5 billion. Our deficit protection is now 9 billion. We're exceeding targets for the past four years running, and we're doing so because of the extensive measures of restraint that we've implemented, because of the cooperation we've had with our stakeholders to ensure that our public services are not only protected, but that they're also sustainable and affordable. And more importantly, Mr. Speaker, we are generating degree of revenues to some of the incentives that we're providing to increase more production, more business investment, more job creations, and that is what's helping our economy recover in a very pragmatic and a very stable environment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, you know, Speaker, I don't think I got an answer to my question. <laughs> to the, uh, I asked the minister very simply to distinguish uh, between, on one hand, he said he's not going to increase taxes, and on the other hand, he said he's going to bring in uh, what he called new revenue tools, which to me sounds like the, the same thing. It sounds like a tax increase. Well, let me um, make this point, Minister. For some time now, the, the Liberals under Dalton McGuinty and Kathleen Wynne have focused on increasing taxes, revenue tools, whatever you want to call them. You increased business taxes. You cancelled personal income tax reductions. You brought in the health tax that you said was going to uh, save health care. You brought in the HST to say that you would use that to balance the budget. Now we have among the the worst deficits in the history of the province and the largest one in Canada. You brought in the eco taxes. Speaker, I could question fill some time exactly with the number of taxes they brought in. A quick question, Minister. Why should we trust you with one penny more when you blew all that money and dug us into a deep hole? Mr. Speaker, Ontario is now the lowest cost, lowest tax jurisdiction in North America. Yeah. We are the most competitive in North America to attract business investments. We have reduced taxes. We have inspired companies to invest. And Mr. Speaker, it, it shocks me that the members opposite, their solutions to the problems and the, and the difficulties and the sensitivities of our recovery, what are they saying? Cut even more. We are the lowest cost jurisdiction per capita for public service anywhere in Canada. We've done a good That'll do. That'll do. Thank you. Carry on. So, Mr. Speaker, we'll stay the course. We're going to continue investing in infrastructure. We're going to continue investing in those incentives and in those initiatives to attract more business. And, Mr. Speaker, we are going to protect public service. We are going to protect health care and education. We are going to protect those things that make us competitive. We're not going to fall prey. Thank you. Just before I go to final supplementary, the member from Northumberland will come to order. Carry on. Well, thank you, um, Speaker. I listened to the minister very closely, and he said that Ontario is the lowest cost and lowest tax jurisdiction in North America, I believe you said. Minister, I, 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 you know that doesn't meet with the facts, and I hope that you'll put more thought into preparing this important budget than you do to um, the speaking notes that you seem to have before you. The, the budget is absolutely crucial. Let me, let me make this point again. Um, you've tried the route of, of increased taxes uh, to, to fulfill runaway spending. In fact, reckless spending its up by 70 per cent under the McGuinty and Wynne Liberals. You also said that you're going to stay the course, but, but I ask you, if increasing taxes and runaway spending have given us the biggest deficit in Canada, 
They put 600,000 people out of work in Ontario today, and our growth rate is Question. actually slowing down. Doesn't it tell you it's time to take a bold new course, go off in a new and different direction, and get Ontario growing again? Thank you. Mr. Finance. Mr. Speaker, we are, in fact, the most, one of the most competitive jurisdictions in North America. Around the world, people are competing for those investments, and Ontario is the third largest jurisdiction in North America to attract foreign direct investments, and we're succeeding. We're succeeding in creating 400,000 net new jobs since the recession. We're succeeding in providing the stimulus and the growth necessary. And, Mr. Speaker, it is critical that we remain competitive. That is why our corporate tax rate and our personal tax rate will remain at its low levels that they are now. And we will not at any time find ourselves in a situation where we're going to put the people of Ontario at risk by taking on some of the issues that they proposed. The member from Prince Edward Hastings come to order. Finish, please. Ten Thank seconds. you, Mr. Speaker. But there is something that the Leader of the Opposition did say that is critical here. He says this budget is crucial. This budget is critical. This budget should be read and it should be looked at, and that is when you should make a decision. We have a good plan, Mr. Speaker. Your question. Leader of the Opposition. Well, um, thank you, uh, Speaker. Of course, the, uh, the role of the Finance Minister is a, um, a critical role. It calls for among the highest levels of competence and command of the facts to say the finance minister you you've not been able to distinguish between revenue tools and new taxes you keep changing your view on where we rank on on costs. minister of the environment come to order focus on on those basics it shakes my confidence on your ability to move towards balance or to get our economy growing again so let me let me give you a very simple proposition under the mcginty and win liberals government spending has gone up by 70 percent it's actually a remarkable and reckless increase in spending we still have a massive deficit. If you actually freeze spending today, if you don't increase spending overall, you can balance the budget within two years. So, Minister, this takes a very simple, direct approach. Freeze spending today, and we can balance the budget in two years and get our Thank economy you. growing again. See you, please. Thank you. Minister. Hey, when it comes to health care. Mr. Speaker. <laughs> We have been extraordinary in keeping our spending growth below 1%. We have maintained a cooperation and a collaboration with our stakeholders to achieve zero zeros throughout our, throughout our deals. We've enabled ourselves together with all parties to, to, to ensure that everyone's doing their part. And Mr. Speaker, I agree the most important and critical thing that we can do is eliminate and tackle the deficit by 2017-18. And that's the path that we're on. We're taking all the steps necessary to invest in our youth and to invest in infrastructure and to invest in our health care and to invest in our education. These are the things that are going to give us long-term competitiveness. These are the things that work. Thank you. And these are the things that we'll continue to do. Thank you. Supplementary. <clears throat> Let's see if I um, follow the minister's uh, arguments. He said, and it is a line in your speech from yesterday, the most important and fundamental thing we can do together to secure our future prosperity is eliminate the deficit. You just basically used that line word for word, but then, Minister, you announced three new spending initiatives. I think you said in infrastructure, you said in training, you said in something else. So I, I want to make sure, if you say you're going to balance the budget and then you announce three new spending initiatives, I mean, how in the world are you actually going to accomplish that unless you truly plan to increase taxes yet again on the backs of hardworking Ontario families? And businesses. Let me give you another approach. Why don't you just stop the scandals like the gas plan, stop the scandals like Orange and eHealth, hold somebody accountable, and then, Minister, again, if you hold spending as it is today, built on a 70 percent spending increase, you can actually Question. balance the budget within two years. But your top priority, why don't you take that path and balance by 2015? Thank you. Minister. So it seems that the member opposite isn't prepared to invest in the people of Ontario and in roads and bridges and in infrastructure and in those very issues that provide for business growth and economic renewal. That is what we're doing. That is what we will do. We have the courage. We have the, the plan. We have what's necessary to provide the hope and opportunity for the people of Ontario. It's not about more government. It's about more opportunity. It's not, it is not 
about cutting for the sake of cutting. Exactly. It's, about it, it's about transforming and ensuring that those public services are maintained at a lower cost. Okay. That is what we're doing, and we will continue to do so, Mr. Speaker. Okay. Thank you. Final supplementary. Because of the um, decision, Speaker, that um, this minister, the Premier Wynne, Premier McGuinty, and the Liberals have made, uh, we now have over 500,000 of our, our friends, our neighbours, our family members who are out of work and losing hope. We're doubling our debt. We've lost 300,000 manufacturing jobs. And the minister's only solution seems to be to spend more, to delay balancing the books, and then increasing taxes. And let me illustrate the threat of, of debt here. Uh, we celebrated the other day, my colleague from Conestoga mentioned Benjamin Leone, uh, Rob's uh, son born in this world. He's born with a $20,000 provincial debt on his back. Before the Liberals came to power, that was 11,000. So he basically almost doubled the debt. So what do you say to young people today when you're putting $20,000 of debt on their backs and then some when you don't balance until 2017? Question. Why are you putting your inability to make decisions today onto the backs of the next generation? Don't we need to go in an opposite direction and build a stronger budget? Exactly. 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 You see it, please? You see it, please? Minister of Finance. So, Mr. Speaker, I've been very clear. We know that the Conservative government federally have not been able to meet their targets. They continue to have increased debt and increased deficits when they had a huge surpluses. And other jurisdictions, other provinces have also had difficulty given the slow growth to meet their targets. Ontario has been very pragmatic. And I'll have a seat. Thank you, Will. The member from Chatham will come to order. Second time. Thank you. So Ontario has been very clear that we are going to balance our books by 2017-18. We've been very strategic and very pragmatic in doing it in a gradual and in a way that will continue to inspire growth and greater prosperity. And, Mr. Speaker, we also want to be fair. We want all Ontarians to benefit. No one should be left behind. We want to ensure that everyone's at their best. This budget will do just that. And I hope the member opposite will read it. I hope the member opposite will give a consideration because it's the right Thank thing you. to do. Thank you. New question, leader of the third party. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. New Democrats have been clear since the throne speech. If we're going to support a budget, it has to create jobs, it has to strengthen health care, and it has to make life more affordable. There are families with loved ones waiting as long as 262 days for home care in this province, and that's unacceptable. We've put forward a simple proposal to ensure a five-day guarantee for home care, and if the government finally keeps its promise to cap CEO salaries in the health sector, it won't add a nickel to the deficit. Will the Premier commit to that today, Speaker? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I appreciate the question from the leader of the third party. And I have been quite clear, both in uh, in our private meetings and in this house, Mr. Speaker, that. We, are, uh, we had identified some areas that we wanted to work on, and many of those areas are areas that the leader of the third party has expressed interest in. One of those is investment in home care, Mr. Very Speaker. Important. I've been very clear that we're willing to work with them and make sure that we, we make the investments that are necessary so that people get home care in a timely way, Mr. Speaker. It's extremely important to families that they know that their loved ones are going to get the care that they need and that they can stay in their homes as long as they want, Mr. Speaker. I've been very clear that that's an area we want to work on with the, the third party, and I, I hope that uh, we'll be able to do that between now and the budget. But we will be making investments in home care, Answer. Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, it's a simple step that would improve our health care system and add certainty to people's lives in a very difficult time. Now, the government talks about targets and goals that they already have in place, but families know that far too often people fall through the cracks and are, and are left waiting hundreds of days on waiting lists that have stretched these days now into the thousands. Is the Premier ready to commit, Speaker, to a guarantee? Is she ready to commit to a guarantee? that people waiting for home care won't be waiting more than five days. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So what I am committing to, Mr. Speaker, is consistent and ongoing improvement exactly. in our health care system. And I think it's I think it's extremely important that political leaders make commitments that are doable, that are achievable, Mr. Speaker, that we not that we not throw out 
numbers in a way that's irresponsible and then not be able to meet those, those uh, goals, Mr. Speaker. I think it's extremely important that we understand what's doable, that we make investments that will improve health care, that will, in fact, as the Minister of Finance said, transform the way we deliver service, Mr. Speaker, because we know that as people age, we are dealing with a whole new demographic and a whole new reality about how service needs to be delivered. So the we're going to continue Hamilton to make Stony investments, Creek. but at the same time, we're changing Sir. the way those services are delivered to make them better, Mr. Thank Speaker. You. Final supplementary. Speaker, people waiting for home care want to see that guarantee, and they want to know that that guarantee is funded fairly. Will the Premier finally enact the hard cap on public sector CEO salaries so that we know that the dollars will be invested in frontline care for patients, not executive compensation? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I hear the spirit of what the leader of the third party is, is talking about, Mr. Speaker, but the, the numbers don't match. In fact, the, the money that needs to be invested in home care goes far beyond any savings that would be acquired by, uh, by capping CEO salaries. I think that is an issue that needs to be addressed. But the bigger issue, Mr. Speaker, is that people need to know that you're right, that, they get, that they're going to get the home care that they need, that they're going to be able to stay in their homes. They also need to know that if they need care in their home from a physician, for example, Mr. Speaker, that that's going to happen, that they will have a house call, they'll have a home visit that will allow them to get the, the care that they need. Those are the kinds of transformations that we're going to make, Mr. Speaker, because that is what will make health care better, that's what will transform the system and will make it capable of dealing with the aging population that is coming down the, the track at us, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. I'd just like to remind the member from Hamilton East Stony Creek that uh, I'll offer some help today if he needs it. Thank you. New question. For my next question is to the Premier, although I'm quite disconcerted that I didn't hear a no, uh, or didn't hear a yes, rather, to uh, no um, hard caps on salaries, and nor did I hear a guarantee of five days for home care. Quite disconcerting. What people want to see in the upcoming budget, though, Speaker, uh, is uh, is something that's concrete. They want to see real results. Uh, they don't want to see uh, a government that they've seen time and time again, uh, you know, fail to deliver on the promises that they make. That's the reality, unfortunately. Alba wrote to us. She lives in Toronto, and she wrote this quote: "I think that the waiting for home care services is so long, on the hope that people will drop dead while waiting." It's very terrifying becoming older, weaker, and sick in this country. I won't have someone like myself to fight for me as I did for my husband. Women like Elba need to see a real guarantee that they won't be waiting longer than five days Question. when they need their home care. Will the Premier commit to Elba and others to a five-day guarantee? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I, I'm just going to make a, a general comment. I've talked about the need to improve home care, and I, uh, I'm very committed to that, Mr. Speaker. But I want to make a comment about the budget process. It is extremely important to the people of Ontario that the people in this legislature take this very seriously, that this is not a political game, that this is not a ping-pong game about you, you, know, you put out a policy and I'll put out a policy and we'll see which one we can fight about and where we land. That's not what it's about, Mr. Speaker. It's about looking at our current situation. It's about looking at the global economic situation. It's about staying on track and being fiscally responsible. And it's about making the investments, the critical investments that the people of Ontario need so that their province and their services can improve over time and we create the conditions for growth. That's what this budget is about, Mr. Speaker. It's not that it's a liberal budget. It's not that it's an NDP Sir. budget or it's a conservative budget. It's the right budget for the people yeah, of Ontario. Yeah. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Supplementary. As speaker, I think that it's about the fact that these are tough times for the families of this province. That's what it's about. They're being asked to pay more. And they see cuts being made to their hospitals and to their health care system. That's what they see. Irma in Toronto had a loved one receiving home care and writes, quote, Based on my experience, I would say that the government was wasting far too much money on management and not spending wisely on ensuring that their clients were getting good care, unquote. Will the Premier guarantee 
that money goes to the needs of patients and take the simple step of capping CEO salaries in the coming budget. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, of course, I will guarantee that money is going to go to the, the service of people in the province, and particularly in the areas of home care. In fact, the Minister of Health and the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment, and I are going to be, and the Minister of Finance, are going to be at a, a, a community service organization in North Toronto in Minister Hoskins' riding this afternoon. It's called Sprint, Mr. Speaker. It's been delivering services to people in their homes for decades, Mr. Speaker. And in fact, some of the ideas for transforming the way we deliver service, i.e. making sure that people get their services in home, making sure that doctors are available to people in their homes. Those ideas come from the organization that we're going to be visiting this afternoon, Mr. Speaker, and I am committed yes, to implementing those changes. The Minister of Health is working on those. That's the transformation of the system that I'm talking about. That will make it sustainable over time, Mr. Speaker. Final supplementary. Speaker, people have told us that they're looking for change, simple, affordable change that makes their lives better. They've been promised it over and over again, but constantly find that they're being asked to pay more and expect less from their government. New Democrats have been clear since the throne speech, Speaker. If we are going to support a budget, it has to create jobs, strengthen health care, and make life more affordable for Ontarians. Will we hear a commitment from the Premier today that she will cap executive salaries and ensure that people waiting for home care will have it in five days guaranteed. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the leader of the third party will hear in the budget when it uh, when it is read. She will hear a commitment to improving the lives of people in Ontario, here, here. and she will hear a commitment in those areas that she has identified because those are areas, Mr. Speaker, that we had identified as needing work. So, youth unemployment, Mr. Speaker, improvement of home care, making sure that people have the services that they need in a timely way, Mr. Speaker. But we will not be held hostage to a list, an arbitrary list, Mr. Mr. Speaker, that I have said many times, Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to work with the leader of the third party, and we are going to do what's in the best interest of the people of Ontario, in the areas that she has identified, Mr. Speaker, and beyond. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Premier. My question uh, this morning is for the uh, Premier. Premier, the amnesia continued this morning at the Justice Committee. We did get a little uh, insight into the Oakville negotiations from your predecessor's policy director, Sean Mullen. Uh, read into the record was testimony that the government was committed to, quote, make TransCanada whole. There were at least 10 references to that. That speaker could cost $1 billion. Ooh, wow. That's a far cry from the $40 million the uh, number the Auditor General told us is unrealistic, and yet you cling to. Former Cabinet Secretary Shelley Jamison told us last week there are, quote, buckets of costs Question. for Oakville. Premier, tell us today about the buckets of costs for Oakville. Thank you. Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I'm you know, the, the, the member mentions the, the witness this morning, and again, Mr. Speaker, I can't help it that the Conservative Party keeps calling witnesses that don't answer questions the, the way they wanted to. It reminds me of their first witness. My favourite, Mr. Speaker, was their first witness. They called the former Speaker of the House of Commons, and I read from the, the Toronto Star, Tory witness bolsters Liberals' case to clear Chris Bentley of wrongdoing. But in terms of the Oakville situation, Mr. Speaker, I think the Honourable Member is aware of two things. The first is that the Auditor General, an officer of the Legislature, is looking into the Oakville gas plant as directed, as asked by the Premier, in an effort to provide transparency. The second thing, Mr. Speaker, that he knows is that his party was front and centre in opposing that gas plant. And, yes, Mr. Speaker, we look forward to testimony from candidates in that riding, candidates that we've asked to come forward who have not yet made themselves available, and we look for his help in asking those witnesses to come to the forefront. Thank you, Speaker. My gosh, uh, Bob Fosse could not have coordinated a better dance routine than that. Oh. Premier, all the public wants to know is how much did the Liberal scandal cost and who ordered the documents to be withheld? Weeks later, we still don't know the real costs. It's clear that every Liberal staffer 
brought before the committee is putting their party's needs ahead of those of the interests of the taxpayer. Not one Liberal is telling us the whole story, Speaker. What we do know is that the Premier's office, along with Cabinet, have directed this scandal from the very beginning. And we do know there was absolutely no regard for the taxpayer. None. The objective was to do a deal at any cost. Speaker, I ask you, Premier, will you end this charade and come clean on the Oakville cost? Question, thank you. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, these are oldies but goldies. The member from Halton, Hansard, June 1st. The people of Oakville have told you they don't want the proposed gas fire power plant, and I agree with them. The member from Halton, press release. Minister, will you move the Oakville power plant? I'm asking the minister to consider moving this plant. The member from Halton told the Toronto Sun, October 7, 2010, it was sad that it took so long for the government to listen to the people of Oakville. It was nice to see that decision. Overturned. Mr. Speaker, again, where is the Conservative costing? We asked for Conservative candidates, both from the Oakville and the Mississauga area, to come forward along with the New Democratic Party candidates. None have made themselves available. I ask the Honourable Member to use his influence to have them come forward Answer. and talk about the uh, work that they did, the analysis to cost out what it would cost to cancel the Oakville plan. Mr. Speaker, Thank we're you. looking forward to that testimony as we are the Auditor General's report. Thank you. New question? The member from Toronto Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Premier. Premier, the more we learn about the private power deals that your government signed, the more we see these deals were great for private power companies and lousy for the people who pay the bills. This morning, the former Premier's senior energy adviser wouldn't tell Ontarians or couldn't tell Ontarians why private power companies were getting to shape the province's electricity plan. Can the Premier explain why TransCanada got a heads up on the province's energy plan before this House was informed? Premier. Government House Leader. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know, I, I actually I appreciate the question that was being asked about the whole issue of siting uh, power plants in this province. It is something that uh, the government, in cooperation with the opposition, have expanded the mandate of the committee to look at, Mr. Speaker. And I think it's about time, Mr. Speaker, that we stop going in on these fishing trips and that the committee actually started to look on how we could move forward. Because the simple fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, that that honourable member represents a party that was equal equally opposed to the Oakville plan, as was the Progressive Conservative Party. Mr. Speaker, all parties in this legislature were opposed. We recognize that there were mistakes made, and I think it would benefit all of us if the committee focused on how to move forward and how to come up with the right decision-making process. Here's supplementary. Boy, you can't even deny this stuff anymore. <laughs> Premier, people expect the electricity system to provide affordable energy for this province so families can pay their bills, so businesses can afford to grow. But instead, the government is promising private power companies they can see the energy plan and make sure it helps them out before the province sees it. Can the Premier explain why private power companies are coming ahead of hardworking families and creation of jobs? Again, again, Mr. Speaker, the honourable member fails to acknowledge his party's record on, on the Oakville situation. It was identical to all the rest of the parties. The member himself said, I don't agree. He told Inside Halton, I don't agree with the Oakville power plant. I don't think it's necessary. There the member are. from Beaches East York in December 2, 2010 said here, I'm glad that the people of Oakville came to their senses. I'm glad the people of Oakville hired Aaron Brockovich and did all there the things is. they did in order to have this killed. Mr. Speaker, there is unanimity of all no parties time. in terms of what happened at Oakville and Mississauga, and I think we all welcome the honourable member and his colleagues and, and all colleagues in the legislature if they want to use this committee as it should be to come forward with recommendations on how we move forward in future decisions. That is a mandate that's been given the committee. Unfortunately, they spent a lot of time on fishing expeditions, Mr. Speaker, Answer. and they should be looking at the broader policy question. Thank you. New question. A member from Mississauga East Cooksville. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment. 
On April 12, a final political hurdle was cleared towards building a second bridge span across the Detroit River. President Obama gave his presidential permit, widely considered the last approval required before we go forward. This is indeed, Speaker, very good news to have the White House's support. And can the minister now tell us what this bridge is going to mean for Ontario's economy and jobs? Well, uh, I certainly thank my colleague for this important question. You know, as Minister of Economic Development, Trade and Employment, I'm very pleased to see that President Obama has endorsed the new Detroit River International Crossing. And, Mr. Speaker, you may not know this, but more than $110 billion in goods cross the Windsor border each year, making this North America's premier trade crossing. And Ontario exports 77 per cent of the goods that we produce here to the United States, and almost a third of that travels across the border into Michigan. So more efficient crossings mean better access to U.S. markets for Ontario manufacturers, helping them to grow and to thrive. Mr. Speaker, North America's auto industry sees millions of vehicle components crossing the border every day to ensure their just-in-time delivery to assembly plants in both Michigan Answer. and Southern Ontario. While the bridge itself is a federal initiative, the province is doing its part by building the $1.4 billion Windsor-Essex Parkway Thank to link you. the new crossing to the 401. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. I'm glad to see that Ontario businesses and families, particularly in Windsor and southwestern Ontario, will benefit from the new Detroit River International Crossing and the increased access to the United States market. Now, the truth is that the United States will continue to be a very important trading ally for Ontario, but we've got to look at new markets, Speaker, because that's where the world is growing. So can the minister tell us what the ministry is doing to help Ontario businesses access new fast-growing markets outside of North America. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you. And of course, the member is right in indicating that we need to look at new markets, not simply existing ones. And last year, the efforts of my ministry and our government helped over a thousand Ontario exporters access or expand their ex export markets through participating in our programs. And for example, over 540 Ontario companies participated in 69 different international trade missions to places in Europe, South America, Asia, the Middle East, and North America. And since 2007, just that, that period of time, we've led 37 internationally uh, minister-led missions and eight premier-led missions to destinations around the world to promote Ontario business. The most recent mission, of course, was to China in January. It resulted in the signing of nearly $800 million in contracts for Ontario businesses. So here in Ontario, we provide consultations, seminars, and many other supports to businesses looking to expand globally. When Ontario companies are looking to expand and globally, our Answer. government will be there to offer whatever assistance we can to help them grow their businesses. Thank you. New question. The member from Leeds, Grenville. Thank you very much, Speaker. My, uh, my question is to the Premier. Last week, your parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Energy compared the Liberal gas plant scandal to the USA putting a man on the moon. He said the U.S. never knew the cost of putting a man on the moon and that your government never knew the cost of cancelling the gas plants. Well, in the wake of those ridiculous comments, we've uh, uncovered a few factoids. Did you know that the average cost of launching a space shuttle, according to NASA, is around $400 million? And if we use NASA's math, which is far more trustworthy than the Premier's math, for the same price of three shuttle launches to outer space, you can save three Liberal MPP seats. So, Premier, do you share Bob Delaney's view that Charles Sousa, Laurel Broughton, and Kevin Flynn's seats are I'm going to uh, I'm going to wait for quiet and definitely remind members this is becoming too frequent i'm going to remind members that they are to use their titles or their writings and uh... it's the spiral down so i'm going to stop it uh... from here on in if i hear that i'll pass the question premier mr speaker and i know that the uh, i know that the minister of energy will want to speak to the specifics in the supplementary but i just i just want to say mr speaker that 
you know, the decision that we made to uh, relocate the uh, and cancel the gas plant projects in Oakville and Mississauga were decisions that were supported by every member of this House, Mr. Speaker, by all parties. We listened to the communities. We made the decisions to relocate those gas plants. Member from Lambton can't come to order. With that, Mr. Speaker, the reality is when projects have been begun, there is a cost associated to uh, making a change. So, Mr. Speaker, I really believe that it's very important that I have been the Premier who has asked the, uh, the, uh, the Auditor General to look at those costs, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that the calculations that are made are open and transparent. That's why we asked the Auditor General to look at it. I look forward to his report, Mr. Speaker. And in the meantime, I think it's great that the committee is able to uh, have broadened its uh, mandate, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, thank you. Uh, my question is back to the Premier. Premier, you have uh, repeatedly stood in this House and promised on the record that you will appear before the Justice the Committee to answer uh, your role in this massive scandal using uh, the member. Uh, it's, it's galactic, that, uh, the, the level of the scandal. <laughs> so, Premier, next Tuesday, you've been invited to appear before the Justice Committee. Will you confirm uh, to the House today that you will order and instruct your staff to not play a calendar or scheduling games. Will you keep your promise and will you confirm your appearance at the Justice Committee investigating the gas plant scandal on Tuesday, April 30th, 2013? Yes or no? Are you coming to the committee? Mr. Energy. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I can say quite unequivocally that the Premier will be in attendance at the committee. But I want to address the main issue that he asked in the main question. He referred to the cost of relocating the Oakville plant. Mr. Speaker, I want to read from a letter that I delivered to the clerk of the committee yesterday afternoon. At the meeting of the Justice Committee on Tuesday, April 23, 2013, Liberal members intend to bring forward a motion requiring the Ontario Power Authority to appear at a meeting of the committee. Our commitment is to be open and transparent. To support the work of the committee, the OPA will be in a position to share their current estimate of long-term costs and savings associated with the relocation of the Oakville plant. As you know, the government has also asked the Auditor General Answer. to report on the Oakville relocation. The auditor's work with the OPA is currently underway, and we look forward to receiving the auditor's Thank you. final report. Mr. Speaker, Thank we are being open. Thank you. Seated, please. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma question. Thank you, Mr. My, my, my question is for the Prime Minister. People affected by the diluted chemo chemotherapy drugs. Windsor Regional Hospital, like all the affected hospitals, used an approved procurement process to source these drugs. Yet, at committee, a hospital official said they were, and I quote, under the impression that some safeguard had been put in place. Speaker, there is ample evidence that the minister knew about this gray area of oversight for years. Can the premier explain why the ministry failed to do their primary job of oversight. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term uh, Care. Speaker, thank you, and thank you for the question, although I, I must say I'm a bit surprised to hear that question. I think it is abundantly clear, Speaker, that when I became aware of the issue of underdosing of chemotherapy drugs, we acted, Speaker, within days. We have heard that Health Canada has been aware of this issue for many years. And I think that uh, as we work together to uh, take the steps necessary to assure patients that they do have access to, uh, to, the, to the right drug speaker, we will be working with Health Canada. I am delighted that last week they announced that they are actually acknowledging that there is an area that needs uh, the attention. Our regulations that we've announced, Speaker, will take us in the direction we need to do. Paul. Thank you. Supplementary. Back to the Premier. Speaker, Ontarians want to know what happened, but they want also to be assured that this kind of lapse in oversight will never happen again. Speaker, I'm really concerned that the ministry seems to be unwilling to acknowledge that they failed to provide oversight. They're unwilling to acknowledge that they even had a role to play. Will the Premier admit 
that there was a mistake that was made by her minister and explain what is being done now to address other unrelated areas in our health care system. Speaker, I uh, once again am happy to say that when we became aware of this issue, we took immediate action. We pulled together all of the partners, Speaker, and uh, there is no question that the health care system is focused on addressing this issue. You heard from the CEO of Windsor Regional Hospital. You heard from the chief of staff at Windsor Regional Hospital, Speaker. Uh, yesterday, they appeared. They are focused on ensuring that this does not happen again. We also have jo Dr. Jake Thiessen, who is working in the whole cancer drug supply. I would hope that the member opposite would be listening to what her critic in Ottawa is saying, the questions that are being asked in Ottawa of Health Canada. Speaker. We have shared responsibility here, and we are acting together Answer. to resolve the issue. Thank you. New question. The member from New York Southwestern. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of uh, Labour. Uh, Minister, it can be tough at times uh, to balance and uh, to care full-time for your children, your aging parents, or both. And recently, I happened to read an article in the Globe and Mail that focused on this very issue, and it profiled a young family the career and personal sacrifices that they needed to make to ensure that their loved ones were properly cared for. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the minister, can the minister tell us what can the government do? How can the government make um, the life of Ontarians who are caring for their loved ones a little easier? Thank you. Thank you, Minister of Labour. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Speaker. I want to thank the member for a very important uh, question. This is a very important issue and something that we, I think, all of us here from our uh, constituents uh, uh, at a frequent uh, basis. Uh, you know, Speaker, we've heard from sole uh, caregivers, we have heard from those who are, uh, are in sandwich generations looking after the elderly parents and their, and their young ones at home as to what we need to do in order to help uh, our uh, elderly parents or, or other family members who may need uh, help. That's why, Speaker, we have put forward a, a piece of legislation that, if passed, uh, would build on the existing family medical leave to provide up to eight weeks of unpaid job leave for employees to provide care and support to a family member with a serious medical condition. In addition, Speaker, that legislation, if, if passed, would complement uh, recent federal initiatives that provide leaves and benefits for parents that yes, need sir. to care for a critically ill child or in cases where a child is missing or dies as a probable result of a crime. This is an important issue, Thank uh, Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for that answer. The introduction of the Leaves to Help Families Act is good news for Ontarians. This version of the bill builds upon the previous version by adding in extra leaves that complement the new grants and the unpaid leaves offered by the federal government. I think that every member of this House and everyone who is watching us today share a common experience. We're all sons or daughters. We have parents and grandparents. We may have spouses and children. And in short, we're all part of a family. And when those family members have a major health problem, we want to be there for them. So through you, Speaker, to the Minister, can the Minister update us on the status of this bill? Question. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And this important speaker is very, uh, um, it, it is important because this bill is important because it will give working Ontarians the one thing they need most, and that is to be time with their loved ones. And I really hope that all MPPs uh, will support this bill. This bill is first and foremost about compassion. Uh, and, 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 and making sure that we know that our families are doing well. Speaker, uh, the, the debate uh, has commenced on this important bill, and what I've heard so far from the opposition members is heartening to me. Uh, I quote the, uh, the member from Lanark, Fort Nag, Lennox and Eddington, who said that uh, they, i.e. the government, has come, come back with a better bill, and of course they do deserve recognition for it, and thank him uh, for those positive comments. Here. Similar for uh, the, the honourable member for Massac, he said that I think it's well-intentioned, I think it's something that is almost that what we would Answer. call a no-brainer. Speaker, I hope we will continue with the sentiment, get the debate done in this House, and send this bill to the committee so that we can move on for providing <laughs> this you. important case for families.
question. The member from Lampton, Kent, Middlesex. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Speaker. My question this morning uh, is for the Premier. Premier, while your government has been lost in space, 600,000 men and women are looking for work in Kathleen Wynne's Ontario. On the Mississauga Power Plant, you blew your own number by 45 per cent, and now Ontario businesses and families are stuck paying your bill. Premier, do you think it's right to force Ontario businesses, families and the 600,000 men and women you have put out of work to pay for your political dirty work? Senior, please. Thank you. Government House. You know, Mr. You're Speaker, you, 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 you can start with you can start with paper, Mr. Speaker. I've got a, a press release here or a comment to the Mississauga News. And it quotes, listen to this, only Conservative leader Tim Hudak will cancel the Eastern Power Gas Plant slated to be built on Laurel and Up. Then, Mr. Speaker, you can go to the Twitterverse, and Ontario PC government will stop the plant for good. Oh. Then, Mr. Speaker, you can go to YouTube and watch the Leader of the Opposition surrounded by I his adoring candidates in front of a crowd of five or six people saying if he's elected, this plant will be done. done. Done, done. Mr. Speaker, the Progressive Conservative Party, the New Democratic Party, the Liberal Party, yes, all sir. of us had the same position in the last election, Mr. Speaker. And again, we're looking forward to hearing their call. Thank you. <laughs> the Attorney General doesn't get the last word, I do. Supplementary. A, a heck of a lot better than Michael Jackson's moonwalk, actually. Uh, speaker, the Auditor General told us one thing, and the Liberal Party is telling us something totally different. What is clear is that political decisions were made, decisions that served to benefit only the Liberal Party of Ontario and are ultimately going to cost Ontario businesses and Ontario families upwards of $1 billion. Yesterday, your government announced that you will table your budget on, March, on May 2nd, and we can only assume that the NDP, your farm team, will be dutifully supporting it. Premier, what is the final number you're going to write beside the words Oakville Power Plant Cancellation Costs? Again, Mr. Speaker, we have heard from the Auditor General. We've heard from the Auditor General in terms of the Mississauga plan, and the Premier asked the Auditor General to look into the Oakville plan. But, Mr. Speaker, we are still waiting to hear about the progressive conservative numbers. In fact, Mr. Speaker, just in reference to an earlier question, we have asked that the Leader of the Opposition, Mr. Hudak, come before the committee next Tuesday where he can discuss his figures. And I hope, Mr. Speaker, that the honourable member will ensure that he doesn't play calendar and say that he's too busy to come before the committee because we're looking forward to his testimony to explain his opposition to the gas. Plan and explain how it would be done, done, done. Very hard. Is your question? A member from Kenora, Kenora Rainy River. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last week, Nishkandaga First Nation declared a state of emergency, looking for provincial assistance with a suicide crisis that has rocked the community. The community attributed these suicides to the social conditions in the community, including prescription drug abuse, poor water quality, inadequate policing, and lack of access to mental health and addictions workers, issues that the province has been aware of for years. My question is simple. Does the Premier believe First Nations need to declare states of emergency to access the basic health services that they need? Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, of course, I do not. Uh, I do not believe that uh, First Nations communities need to declare states of emergency in order to get services. And, Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity to speak with uh, Chief Munias uh, at the at the time that the uh, the emergency was declared to make sure that Emergency Management Ontario was aware, Mr. Speaker, to make sure that everything that we could do uh, that we would do to uh, to deal with the particular circumstances. I know that uh, the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs has also had a chance to uh, to speak with. The, the chief and Mr. Speaker, uh, we will need to work with our partners, as is always the case in these situations, because the federal government and the provincial government and First Nations communities always have to work in partnership because these are shared responsibilities, Mr. Speaker. So we are very much a part of that, and we are uh, doing everything that we can. Thank you. Supplementary. 
Nushkandaga is not the first community to declare a state of emergency. It is only the latest. In 2009, it took pressure of the NDP to get the Ontario government to commit funding for Pegatano First Nations suicide prevention program. Yet last year, the same government cancelled $1.7 million of that funding, leaving the community without support. Each and every community across the far north is dealing with similar challenges, and as the former Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, the Premier knows this well. Will the Premier commit today to address the social conditions existing on all First Nation communities, or does every community need to declare a state of emergency to get basic help from your government? Mr. Speaker, <laughs> I, uh, I, am, I am so committed to uh, improving the lot of the people who live in First Nations communities. And Mr. Speaker, you know these are these are complex issues that are rooted in a history, Order. Mr. Speaker, of which all of us have to share some shame and blame, Mr. Speaker, because we have not, as a society, provincial government, it doesn't matter what party, it doesn't matter what level of government, we have not always worked in the best interest of the people who we share this this province with, Mr. Speaker. And so whether it's First Nations education or whether it's First Nations health care, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's the infrastructure on reserves, I am committed to working with my colleagues, to working with the federal government, Mr. Speaker, to working with the First Nations communities to make sure that we address these complex issues. We have done more, Mr. Speaker, to build those relationships and make sure that services flow to First Nations in the last Thank 15 you. years, Mr. Speaker, and we will continue to do that work. The member from Scarborough Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Research and Innovation. This government recognizes the importance of collaboration and partnership. It is often recognized that the collaboration and partnership great, create great ideas and te technologies are born. Ontario's life science sector is access and case in point where researchers, public institutions, and private sector work together in finding solutions. Our, science, our life science community acts as a key driver for our province and economy, creating high-level jobs, producing important breakthroughs. The statistics of Ontario life science sectors are impressive. There are approximately 38,000 high-value jobs, 1,000 companies, $9.1 billion in revenues, and export values of $5.7 billion. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister of Research and Innovation, what is this government doing Russia? to ensure that our life science sector is supported? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member from Scarborough Aging Corps for that question. Mr. Speaker, by bringing together our world-class scientists and our leading research institutions and a strong private sector, we can make important discoveries that generate economic growth and also create jobs. Mr. Speaker, recently we invested $36 million in 17 research projects in seven research institutions and universities in the Greater Toronto Area. We also announced a $100 million investment in the Ontario Brain Institute. Mr. Speaker, we have committed to $357 million to the Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. We are also encouraging and helping medium-sized and small-sized businesses to conduct research and make innovations in biotechnology, biomedical, and also pharmaceuticals. Mr. Speaker, as the Minister Answer. of Research and Innovation, I am proud of the record of this government. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm glad to hear that our government is taking steps to support new in ideas and technologies that will drive Ontario's future economy and create jobs. In this global economy, it is critical to promote collaboration and build on the strength of our life science community. Yesterday, the Minister of Research and Innovation participated in the Bio 2013 International Convention in Chicago. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister of Research and Innovation, can he please tell the House what this government is doing to promote and attract global investments in Ontario? Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, again, I thank the member for that question. On Sunday and the Monday, uh, Mr. Speaker, I had the opportunity to participate in Bio 2013 International Convention in Chicago. The Bio 2013 Convention is one of the largest and the most important global events in biotechnology industry. Mr. Speaker, the event featured conferences and exhibitions well attended by policymakers, scientists, and business leaders from around the world. 
organized by the Biotechnology Industry Organization. The event gave Ontario's uh, delegations of more than 300 people, Mr. Speaker, scientists and engineers and business leaders to attend this conference and had the opportunity to learn and, uh, and about major trends affecting the industry and also network with scientists and the business leaders from around the world. But most importantly, Mr. Speaker, Answer. the convention gave the opportunity to showcase Ontario's strengths in the world stage. Mr. Speaker, this event also helped Thank promote you. global investments in Ontario that generates economic growth and create jobs in this province. Thank you. New question, the member from Holton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the, member, to the Premier. Premier, let us recall what the leader of the NDP stated in the legislature on April 16th. And I quote, what's really shocking for the people it, it, is the Premier doesn't seem to be showing any remorse or regret. Instead, it's just full steam ahead with politics as usual. Ontarians learned that the people of this province are going to be paying $275 million for the cancellation of the Mississauga Power Plant. Why can't the Premier admit that this was cynical politics at its worst and actually show some remorse for this waste of public money?" End quote. Premier, his statements like this that indicate to the people of Ontario that the NDP will support uh, calling the APC motion for debate when it is tabled. Will you commit to getting results Question. for the people of Ontario and calling our motion for debate when it is tabled, or will you hide from this confidence motion and Thank push you. it aside like all your other Thank Liberal you. scandals? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, Mr. Speaker, there are two parts of that question that I want to address. The first is on the regret, Mr. Speaker. I think we could go through Hansard and you can count the number of times that I have said regret. In fact, maybe we'll have somebody do that. But I have said consistently, Mr. Speaker, that I regret that we are in this situation, Mr. Speaker. I regret that we were not able to make a decision earlier, Mr. Speaker, because there is always a cost associated with backtracking when a project has begun. So I've been very clear that I regret that. I've said it was a political decision, Mr. Speaker. It was a political decision that all parties agreed with, Mr. Speaker. In terms of, in terms of confidence in this government, Mr. Speaker, there is a huge opportunity looming. There's a huge opportunity looming for the, the members in this House to express confidence or not in the government, Answer. and that is called the budget, Mr. Speaker. May 2nd, there is an opportunity for people in this legislature to express their confidence, Mr. Speaker. Premier, you talk the talk, but you don't walk the walk. We still haven't got answers. Premier, the NDP may think it's okay to prop up your Liberal government in the midst of a scandal, or when it means the destruction of thousands of good jobs in the horse racing industry. But even they must recognize that this gas, gas plant scandal is the straw that broke the cat horse's back. Premier, if you've, you've dismissed this motion of confidence as a PR stunt. Your assistant to the Minister of Energy has even compared it to the massive waste of money of a, to a moon mission. All proof that your government just doesn't take this issue seriously. Well, the people of my constituency take this issue very seriously. If you think you have the confidence of this House and the people of Ontario, Question. call the motion of confidence when we table it and prove you retain the confidence of this House. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And there is no one in this House that's looking forward more to the uh, expression of confidence in the government on the budget than I am, Mr. Yep. Speaker. We share, we share that anticipation, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to it. I do hope that as members of the official opposition, that the, uh, the members will read the budget, Mr. Speaker, that they will actually look at what's in it. It disturbs me that the critic has said that no matter what is in the budget, they're going to vote against it. It doesn't seem to me that that is a very responsible position, Mr. Speaker. The other thing I want to say is that we take Attorney General, issues around the gas plant answering. extremely seriously, Mr. Speaker. That is why, when I came into this position, I, I called for an open process. I asked for an expansion of the mandate of the committee so that a full range of questions could be asked. I said I would appear before the, the committee. I'm going to on Tuesday, Mr. Speaker, and I said that I was going to ask the Auditor General to look at the Oakville situation. Thank you. I've done all those things, Mr. Speaker. Uh, yeah. Question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. 
Thank you, Speaker. My question to the Minister of Education. Last year, the government eliminated the program enhancement grant that supports arts in schools. Now we're seeing the impact on children. According to People for Education, only 44 per cent of Ontario elementary schools now have a full-time or part-time specialist music teacher. That's a drop of 5 per cent from last year and the lowest since 2005. Why is the government reducing student access to music in Ontario schools? Thank you, Minister of Education. Yes, thank you, and I'm very uh, pleased to be able to talk about uh, music education in our schools because, in fact, I believe that music education in our schools is extremely important, just as is music education in the performance arts, education in the visual arts, and, in fact, all those things are part of the curriculum speaker. And we fund the curriculum through the foundation grant. Uh, the foundation grant, which uh, the, the Per Pupil Foundation grant provides the core funding, but you know, Speaker, we have also provided additional money for 4,900 elementary specialist teachers so that there is an opportunity for school boards to make a choice. Some Answer. have chosen to spend that money on music teachers, some on arts teachers, some on phys ed teachers, some on tech Thank teachers, you. but there there are specialist Thank teachers in this. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Minister, yesterday Graham Henderson, President of Music Canada, spoke quote, of the declining commitment toward music education in Ontario. Indeed, access to music teachers has fallen drastically since 1998. Only one in four schools in Northern Ontario has a specialist music teacher, and low-income students are least likely to have the opportunity to sing in a choir or play in a band. When will the minister take action to ensure that all students in Ontario have access to music in their education? Well, as I just said, Speaker, all students do have mu access to music because it's part of the curriculum, and you should not assume that an elementary teacher who is not a specialist teacher does not actually have the ability to teach music, because many do have qualifications in music as well. But I think we need to go back and look at the People for Education report a little bit more closely, because if you look at their own report, they said that the number of schools with a music teacher exclusive to that school was 49 per cent, plus 30 per cent had itinerant music teachers in 2010-11, uh, and I 79 per cent of schools. If you look at the next year, uh, yes, there was a trend to itinerant music teachers because declining enrollment was happening. But you, you actually find, when you add up the numbers, Thank that you. 82 per cent of Uh, I would remind the Minister of Education, I stand, you sit. The Premier on a point of order. I beg your indulgence, Mr. Speaker. There were four more constituents of mine I apparently missed. Anne-Marie Branch, Martha McNeil, Barbara uh, Abrams, and Joan Tadman, and I apologize. <laughs> well, so, the member from Timmins, James Bay, on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, somebody all the way from Holtire now lives around somewhere down south. Mr. James Moffat is here. Thank you. Before we recess, I've been hearing uh, a couple of things that I want to bring to the attention of the House and ask all of the members and ask all of the members to help me with this, and that is uh, when we mention somebody's absence, uh, it is a very long-standing tradition that we remove ourselves from making comment on anyone's uh, absence, as uh, most people may not know the reason why. And I would suspect that we would all be very uh, gentle on that particular issue. The second one is uh, when people are answering questions or putting questions, I'm beginning to hear an inordinate amount of heckling from with the same side. Uh, so I would ask you to stop trying to provoke by making comments while someone is questioning or making comments while someone is answering to lower instead of raise uh, the pro provocation. So uh, please help me with that and I think we will be able to move forward quite well. Uh, there are no deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.